of the uh, socialism was the big movement of the 20th century, the big ideological and political movement. <coughs> and uh, what we're seeing at the end of the 20th century is one of the very exciting time in which to live because we're seeing the, the collapse of socialism, the revolutionary implosion of socialism. <coughs> uh, the, uh, what, we, what, was, what, what happened was that over the last several centuries, starting in the 17th and going up to the 18th and 19th century, we had a, a march, a, an upward march, not, not of course, a, a, every day, but basically an upward march uh, of, of freedom <clears throat> and uh, the death of the old order, which was statism and serfdom and slavery and uh, theocracy. <clears throat> and uh, rising up from this, from this muck, was, was the idea of individual freedom and, and the institution of individual freedom, personal freedom, religious freedom, political freedom, economic freedom, free markets. And with that came uh, international peace, replacing uh, war, constant dynastic wars and, and uh, territorial conquests, <clears throat> and the rise for the first time in history of mass consumption. In other words, standards of living, not only increasing standards of living, but standards of living that were actually rising from uh, subsistence level, uh, where the general public could buy stuff. This is you know, unusual, unique in world history. In the old days, you didn't buy stuff. You didn't go to the store and buy stuff. It was the, the housewife... You bought cloth if you had the money, and the housewife would sew the clothing and stuff. <clears throat> and that was the, the idea of mass production for the for a consumer market as, a, as an industrial revolution concept of the product of the free markets of the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. <clears throat> so what you had is, I mean, just saying the growth of the standard of living doesn't, doesn't really encompass that. It's a, the beginning of a real living standard. <clears throat> and uh, with this, you have a tremendous progress in all areas, in civilization and, and economics and, and personal liberty and technology, which goes along with it. <clears throat> and, um, and so the 19th century was the, was the breaking through of this century, several century old movement of what we call classical liberalism. Of course, those they didn't, they didn't call it classical. <laughs> uh, we call it classical because it sort of died out and we're trying to uh, essentially restore it. And, uh, and this, this liberal movement was, was rising and everything was going great and the liberals at the time were very optimistic, as they was well they should be. And then something happened. A glitch happened. Something happened on the way to, uh, to uh, Nirvana, uh, <laughs> and the something that happened was the growth of was the development of socialism, which was a brand, brand new idea in human history. <clears throat> and uh, the socialist idea, which really sprouts in the 1830s and 1840s in, in Europe, uh, was that we can still have this because the, the the previous opposition to classical liberalism, the, the opposition to freedom, was an opposition in defense of the old order, it was specifically anti-industrial anti-mass consumption movement, the idea of keeping the lords and the dukes and the earls in their places in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the state churches, and keeping their power and position. It was, a, it was specifically and frankly an anti-general freedom movement, an anti-industrial movement. Well, the socialists came along and said, look, we can do both things. We can have, we can have the same thing. Too. We can have uh, higher standards of living. As a matter of fact, we'll have better than, than liberalism or capitalism does it. We can have a high on advancing standard of living, we can have freedom and we can have everybody be happy and so forth and so on. We can do it through state control. We have better, a better, uh, better ways through statism. And we can have, in fact, we'll have more state control than before. We'll have the people's state. Instead of having a class state of a few people running it, a few dukes and uh, kings, etc., we can have the whole people collectively running the people. <laughs> so, uh, so this concept of collectivism is a brand new thing and it sounded great and was generally... Uh, supported by uh, many folk who was either yearn for the old order or try to blend the, the two liberalism and anti-liberalism to one higher, allegedly higher synthesis. And so by the end of the 19th century, if you go read some of the classical liberals, it's, it's, uh, it's a sad thing because the classical liberals of the late 19th century, around 1900, saw the whole thing as cracking. The socialism was on the march, and the general public was backing it. Because the general public previously had backed libertarianism or classical liberalism. We, we were a mass movement in the 19th century. In England and much of the continent and the United States, we had the votes. We were libertarian. We had libertarian parties, so to speak, not the name of the actual content. <clears throat> but by the late, by 1890s or 1900, every the days of night were closing in. The shades were, were closing in, uh, and uh, and Herbert Spencer and all, uh, other classical liberals writing at the time were very pessimistic. My God, the whole thing is shot. Civilization has had it, and as such, they were right. They saw the they forecast, foresaw the the uh, terror of the 20th century, the, the gulag, etc., of the 20th century. <clears throat> anyway, by, the, by 1900 or so, the general opinion, uh, uh, so-called intelligent opinion, was socialism is morally correct. 
Uh, that's right. It's morally correct that social justice would be imposed, et cetera, et cetera, through this new collectivism. And the only problem was, will it work? They weren't, people weren't sure it would work because it's so radical and new. But the thing is, socialists are captured to conquer the high moral ground. Everybody agreed that they're morally, morally correct, but just a certain practicality hadn't cleared up yet. <laughs> well, if, you have, if you're in a situation where everybody says, in general opinion, and, and intellectuals, etc., say that the socialists are right, or they're morally correct, it's just we're not sure it will work, the next step, inevitable next step, is, okay, let's, let's let them try it. Let's see if it'll work or not. And that's, the, that's what happened in the 20th century. It sums up the 20th century, starting, of course, with the Bolshevik Revolution. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, well, let it work. I, I, was, I grew, up, grew up in the 1930s, and in the 1930s, the general view was, well, of course, there's certain excesses in Russia. <clears throat> uh, a, few people, uh, a few people got their head chopped off, but that's, let's see, this is a noble experiment. We, let's see if the social, social experiment works. We'll have to, you know, have to wait and see. Let's see if, the, you know, the famous phrase in those days was, in order to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. Uh, and, of course, the people who wear the eggs didn't like it too much. <laughs> uh, but who cares if you have a wonderful collective omelet, which we can all eat. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, anyway, we now have the record, okay? I mean, after the 20th century, is essentially, as I say, a process of socialism working itself out. And uh, by the way, I see no difference really between socialism and communism. I feel it's the same thing. Uh, by the way, this was the, the view of the, 18, the original socialists of the 1830s and 40s. To them, socialism and communism are interchangeable terms. And um, uh, it's only later in the 20th century when the fruits of socialism began to be pretty bitter. People didn't like the fact, hey, we got slave labor here and, and, and mass murder. And then socialists in the United States would say, well, if that's not our socialism. We didn't, we didn't plan on that. Uh, we want democratic socialism with freedom and free speech and all that. Just we want collective ownership and means of production. <clears throat> so the idea of so-called democratic socialism was a cop-out uh, where socialists refused to accept the consequences of their own, their own policy and action. <clears throat> uh, and uh, in World War II... When F.A. Hayek wrote the, wrote the Road to Serfdom, uh, this is a big thing. If you read it now, it seems well, kind of plunky. It seems to be sort of, uh, everybody agrees on this, but they didn't agree on it at the time. When he wrote the Road to Serfdom in 1943-44, this is a revolutionary statement, because what he said was, there ain't no such thing as democratic socialism. If you have government ownership and planning of means of production, if you, plan, if you have government planning of the economy, it means everybody's life is being planned. You can't have free speech, you can't have democracy, you can't have freedom of the press freedom of assembly or expression, if you have government ownership and control of the means of production. It's essentially what he said in those days was bitterly opposed by most right-thinking, upstanding right-thinking people. Um, and uh, it now turns out, I'm not going to show evidence of this as going along, this is, this is now agreed upon by almost everybody, almost everybody, certainly in the communist countries agree, it, agree on it. Uh, that, you, that, that, that economic freedom and free markets go hand in hand with personal freedom and freedom of the press and, and freedom of expression. Uh, the, uh, well, what happens is that the, with the record of socialism piling up <coughs> uh, after World War II becomes pretty obvious. Have slave labor camps, gulags, concentration camps, mass murder, genocide, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, begin to have a kind of a weakening of the position here. The, the legitimacy, uh, the high moral ground begins to crumble a little bit. Okay. Uh, and... Um, the, um, and, 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 and public opinion and the general intellectual etc. began to realize there's something morally bad about socialism. Doesn't seem to uh, doesn't seem to really give the high moral uh, ground here. Uh, and the and also what happened I think is also important to, to to realize here that the what happens over history we think of it and and the time we think of every day to day things are not happening no changes are taking place. You look at the Seems, still seem jerks in power, Democrats, Republicans. It looks as if nothing's really happening. There's no change. It's sort of a frozen system. Well, it's, it, become, it continues, quote, frozen, unquote, for a long time as small tensions develop, disagreements, conflicts, and suddenly, this is what happened, what's happening now in the communist countries, suddenly, bingo, like that, so a sudden eruption. It's like the French Revolution. Nothing much was happening in France for about 80 years. More and more statism, people grumbling, etc., etc., and suddenly, there's some trigger and, the, and, the, and the, there's an eruption of all the pent-up tensions and, and, and uh, conflicts that have, that have been piling up. So uh, what, happened in, in, in what happened in the communist countries is the original revolutionary generation 
uh, began to die out. If you're committing your whole life to a cause, you're up on the guerrilla, guerrilla warfare on the hills or whatever you are, and you take, you seize power in a country, as in Russia or in Cuba or whatever, uh, or in China, you know, you're, the original revolutionary generation is committed to it. They murder all the people who are not committed to it, for one thing. Only <laughs> the people with the dissidents and the guys who are beginning to question get, get sent to the slave labor camp or get, or get killed. Uh, and so uh, these guys continue to be committed to the cause until they die out. And uh, I'm not in favor of death, you understand, but there's a certain, there's a certain sociologically, the older generation, of the people, the, the revolutionary leadership die out. The younger people coming up are not that committed. They're sort of born into the system. It's a big difference between fighting on the hills and marching down and taking over and seizing power. It's a very heady thing to seize power. <laughs> uh, you can put up with a lot of, a lot of heartache and, and, and starvation, etc., cetera, et cetera, especially if you're in the ruling elite. You don't get to starve anyway. You're in pretty good shape. And so uh, being in the ruling elite and having founded the the uh, new revolutionary society, you're going to be committed to it for life in general. Uh, but the new people coming up as the next generation succeeds generation, they're not committed to it. They're just born in it. And the, and the fascinating thing is that you know, the totalitarian, one of the lessons of the current situation is that totalitarianism doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Because these people were brought up in Russia and China and the separate stuff, were brought up from the, the year zero to accept, to listen to all this crap, get it from the beaming from the, from the government-run educational system down to the local block level. You owe your life to the society, you're, you're the slave of the state, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it doesn't take, the great thing is it doesn't take. And freedom is, a na is obviously a natural condition of mankind. It just erupts. You can't crush the spirit of freedom. It's just magnificent. Uh, so the 1984, the Orwell, the Orwell uh, doom and gloom message, which was a great book, but it's just it's not true because it doesn't work. You can't suppress the, uh, the spirit of freedom. That's what we're finding out. I remember when... Uh, when the Chinese communists first took over uh, in the 1950s or so, there was a, uh, I think the Yugoslavs uh, had a very interesting movie about China, communist China. <clears throat> I, I saw the movie, it was very interesting because uh, the interviewer was talking to, the, to an allegedly average Chinese communist family, and they said, they asked the mother and father, what would you like your kid to be when he grows up? And they said, well, all we want for the kid is to be the as an obedient subject of the government, the state, the people's state. It was a pretty chilling thing to watch. And uh, I said to myself, geez, is it really true? And they really, I really brainwashed this whole nation. You know, is it really truly that mankind has been transformed? The so-called new socialist man has been created, which is just a willing robots uh, to the state apparatus. And uh, I asked a friend of mine at the time, who had just been released, uh, he, was, he, was, he had been in the State Department in China. He was interned during the Korean War. And... Uh, so he was a China expert, and I asked him, well, is this really true? Is it true that the Chinese have been totally brainwashed? We're going to have a new, a new socialist man, a new communist man emerging. And he said, no, don't worry about it, because in China is an old tradition. When the central government official comes to town, you tell him what he wants to hear. And when he leaves town, you go about your business again. And so it, it turned out. And uh, it's a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful thing, the way people can adapt and yet keep their, uh, much of their personal integrity. And so, of course, it turns, up, turns, about, it turns out to be true. <clears throat> So the new generation coming up, uh, they hear about Marxism, Leninism, well, I don't, they, they don't believe this crap anymore. And uh, about 10 years ago or so, Earl Ravenel, who's a libertarian foreign policy expert, went to Russia for the first time in many years, visited Moscow. This is way before any kind of glasnost or perestroika. And he came back, and I spoke to him, he said, you know, it's a fantastic thing. Nobody in Russia believes in Marxism anymore. Nobody. He spoke to all sorts of people, big shots, little shots, whatever. <laughs> Nobody believes this junk anymore. But so what, what began to happen is, as the generations continue, had a bunch of people in power who were sort of ap operating by inertia. They wanted to keep their power, obviously. There was no more legitimacy on the part of the, they had no more legitimacy. No more Marxism, Marxism, Leninism, purely lip service. And once you lose, you, use, you lose your legitimacy, you lose your moral um, legitimacy, so to speak, the rest, the, 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 the collapse of the system becomes inevitable, especially if the system doesn't work, which is my next point. I mean, there was the moral legitimacy of, of socialism is finished, and certainly finished in the communist countries. It's not finished, unfortunately, in the West. The only Marxists left are in American universities, <laughs> Western, <laughs> Western European universities. Uh, it began to be a, a, a joke. So it's not much of a joke, it's sort of a political joke, but it's a pretty good, nevertheless. And among economists, this was by the 1950s and 60s. 
uh, when most economists were, in the West were still Keynesians and semi-socialists, and, uh, uh, and the joke was, in inter- at international economic conferences, the, the, co- the economists from the communist countries were talking about the virtues of the free market, and the, and the economists from the West were talking about the virtues of government planning. <laughs> okay? Well, uh, th- so that's, that's, this keeps, keeps going on. It's kept escalating. <clears throat> and, uh, and what you have is, is, is uh, in the communist countries, where it's obvious, first they lose the moral legitimacy and the re- revolutionary enthusiasm, and then they see the goddamn thing doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You don't get mass prosperity. You have mass starvation. And a grinding, crummy system that keeps you know, on. And if you get any consumer goods at all, it's all gray and miserable, crummy. Okay? <laughs> and they don't want to live in a crummy world. Okay? And they see the... They, they, they interchange with the West. They see that other people are in, are in pretty good shape, uh, and why can't we have the same sort of thing? And this, and this, and the realize, and they want. They're committed in the communist countries. They're committed to the industrial revolution. They're committed to a modern industrial economy. They realize they can't get it with uh, under socialism. They just can't get it. It's become, it's become painfully obvious as, t- as time has gone on. <clears throat>